Good afternoon and Namaskar to everyone. Good afternoon. As our initiative of the India Art and Friendship series is getting popular, we are, he we are here for yet another lecture under this series. Today's topic is, our is related to mathematics. Yes, for some it is very fascinating area of study, but for some it is very difficult to understand the labyrinth of the great number <coughs> Is scribbled by the educator on the blackboard. Whatever is the case, there is no doubt that without mathematical calculation, it would not have been possible for the mankind to make inventions for the development of the society, making the life comfortable for all of us. And we are now so used to these inventions that it is not possible to imagine life without them, be it G GPS in our cars or weather forecasts, that we check every morning before planning our day out. It would not be over an overstatement to say that India's contribution is equally valuable in this area, paving the way for many great inventions. To educate us more on this engrossing subject, today we have with us Professor Peter Lynch, who is Emeritus Professor at the School of Mathematics and Statistics in UCD. Professor Lynch is graduated in Mathematical Science from UCD in 1968, PhD from Trinity College Dublin in 1982 for research in dynamical meteorology. The primary focus of his subsequent research was numerical weather prediction. He developed several innovative techniques for computer weather forecasting, some of which are in operational use in international weather centers. Much of his career was spent with the Irish Meteorological Service mid -Aden. For the past 10 years, Professor Lynch has written articles on mathematics for the Irish Times. His first mathematical collection, That Maths, The Mathematical Magic in Everyday Life, was published by Gill Books in 2016. The volume 2 appeared in 2020 and volume 3 in 2022, published by Logic Press of IE. Pro Professor Lynch has won several international awards notably the Silver Medal of the European Meteorological Society for outstanding contribution to meteorological education and outreach activities, important scientific contribution to numerical weather forecasting, and leadership in international collaborations. Professor Lynch is a fellow of several professional societies and a member of the Royal Irish Academy. Before I request Professor Lynch to take on the dais, I would request His Excellency the Ambassador of India to say a few words on today's topic of the lecture. Very good afternoon, Namaskar. A uh, very warm welcome to each one of you to India Legacy. We are truly privileged to have you and the opportunity of welcoming you uh, for this uh, very special uh, lecture series. Uh, to give you the background, the idea behind this India Art and Friendship, uh, friendship Lecture Series uh, is uh, as part of our celebration of our 75 years of independence of India. And also this is 100 years of Ireland's independence. So as a new ambassador of India to Ireland, I have been thinking about how do we strategize for the next 25 years. And I, in that process, uh, I find that while our People-people ties are growing. We have uh, more than 50,000 strong Indian community in Ireland. <coughs> India is all, Ireland is also becoming very popular with our students. Uh, more than 6,000 students are coming every year to Ireland. India is now the largest source of international students to Ireland outside the European Union. Also, our trade and investment ties, our business ties are growing. But the biggest potential to me between India and Ireland is in the domain of ideas. Uh, and uh, many of you may remember that uh, Ireland's freedom struggle had tremendous resonance back home in India and inspired different techniques that were uh, innovated by Irish friends and they inspired people back home in India. Similarly, when we were drafting our constitution, uh, 1946 to 49, then we were very closely in consultation with Irish legal experts. And President Ibn Gibadera himself was very, very generous to share his first-hand impression and idea and 
insights into uh, functioning of a Republican constitution to our experts. Uh, and our Prime Minister Nehru, he was very closely in touch with uh, Irish leaders. <coughs> and uh, in poetry, uh, Rabindranath Tagore, uh, the first uh, Nobel Literary Prize of winner from India, uh, he was a close friend of the Bruti Yates, and the Bruti Yates indeed played a key role in uh, getting, uh, getting Tagore's poetry popularized in the West because Yates wrote the introduction to Tagore's Gitanjali. And that uh, uh, created a lot of interest in UK and other European uh, literary circles, and eventually he won, uh, uh, Tagore won Nobel Prize in 1913. Uh, uh, in the contemporary times, I see there's a lot uh, that we can learn from each other. Uh, both in terms of the, the uh, experience of vibrant democracies with Republican constitution, also in terms of day-to-day -day functioning of our societies, innovations that Ireland is introducing, uh, they are quite relevant. India is very big, much bigger, much more complex, so not everything happening is here has relevance for India, or what is happening in India has relevance for Ireland. There are a lot of things which do have common interests. And one area uh, which really struck me is the field of education. Ireland uh, has been very innovative in education. And uh, it is thanks to your very creative, very, very focused uh, commitment to high quality, world standard of education uh, from the mid 60s or so that Ireland transformed itself from an agrarian farming-based society to a knowledge-based, cutting-edge, uh, innovative society, economy. Uh, and how uh, education itself, the methodology of transferring knowledge from one person to other, to the teacher, to the student, that is very, very fascinating. And uh, I'm myself a son of a professor, so I have a special bias towards education field. Uh, and when we, my wife and I came to Ireland, uh, we were very struck by one great professor who is here with us, his, his writing. Because I'm an engineering student, I'm very fond of uh, mathematics, but there are many who are not so fond of, they are scared of mathematics. So it really struck me how uh, such great scientists and uh, thinker who has done cutting edge work in uh, metrology and uh, weather forecasting and computer science mathematics, He's tackling a fundamental issue, how do you teach mathematics? How do you make common people who are not scientists, not engineering mathematics, science students, how do they relate to mathematics? So uh, his work really appealed to me, and I thought this would be a theme which would be of great interest to people back home in India who are listening uh, through Facebook Live and also through social media uh, platforms and follow this is people. So this is a very interesting theme um, not only for us in the embassy, but also people in Ireland, but also back home in India. And that was the idea with which I made a very special request to Professor Lynch to come and deliver this special lecture, because this would be really motivational. Uh, we in India attach a lot of importance to scientific and technological education, and we are doing quite well. And in IT, India has become a very major hub uh, in biotechnology, in pharmaceuticals, and also in fundamental research. Uh, in space technology, we have done quite well, uh, launching missions to the Mars in the very first attempt, uh, and uh, uh, launching 104 satellites in one mission. So we have done quite well. But in terms of education, I think there's a lot that we have to learn, particularly the methodology of education. Uh, and. Uh, uh, mathematics itself uh, has always fascinated our rishis, our sages, our Vedic scholars. And what really like intrigues me that the, the vastness, uh, the, the infinitude. In Indians, the rishi, in India, the rishis had done kind of a very magical conception of one single thing, supreme being, the Brahman. Uh, he, uh, he, it was not he or she, it was it, uh, like uh, gender neutral. Uh, and also uh, that Brahman is infinite and also it is 
subtler, minuter, more like smaller than the smallest, and bigger than the biggest. Ano raniyan, mahato mahiyan. The same entity is smaller than the smallest, finer than the finest, and bigger, larger than the largest. So, dissolving the contradictions has been a fascination with uh, Indian thought, thought leaders uh, from Vedic period. Uh, so, uh, this, is a, this is an area of great interest to people in India, and like everyone else, I'm also very eagerly looking forward to listening to you, Dr. Lynch. I'm really grateful that uh, you spare time to visit us in India House and also spare time uh, to deliver this lecture. I'm really grateful to you. And uh, with uh, profound gratitude, I request you to deliver the lecture. Mm -hmm. topics but very much interrelated on enormous numbers of various sorts which we can all kind of relate to and then uh, say something about how India has contributed in crucial ways to mathematics for thousands of years. Um, as His Excellency pointed out, I mean, there's a very long tradition of interest in mathematics in India and uh, for more than 3,000 years. Sometimes this has been for practical reasons, <coughs> whether it's in engineering or measuring land areas or uh, predicting weather or trying to uh, predict the, the oncoming of the rainy season and so on, vitally important problems. But also there has been an intellectual curiosity to talk about things like infinity, uh, the Jains actually conceived of many different orders of infinity, a whole hierarchy of infinities, long before any Europeans dreamt of such amazing things. So it's a, it's a long story, but I'm going to begin with a bang. I'll explain in a moment what I'm going to do. It's a simple demonstration. I'm going to do something which has never been done before in the history of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> and will never be done again before the end of time. If you don't believe me. So take a pack of cards, 52 cards. I've shuffled them up. I've already shuffled them. Okay? And I put them down. That's a world first. That has never been done before. The cards have never occurred in that arrangement since the beginning of time and will never be found again unless somebody grabs it and makes a note of the, note, of the, the arrangement. How can I make such an outlandish claim? Well, there are 52 cards in the pack, so I have 52 choices for the top card. Having chosen that, I've now 51 choices for the next card, 50 for the next and so on. You can see it gets big already for the first two cards. I have over two and a half thousand possibilities. For three, it goes up and up and up. And by the time I get to the end, I have this, and um, now I have to use my pointer for a moment. <coughs> okay, 52 multiplied by 51 multiplied by 50, and this little scheme, the beloved of mathematics, dot, 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 means carry on and carry on, down to three, two, one. And that's called the number 52 factorial. And I might say that it's big, but that would be an utter understatement. It's totally enormous. There we are, it won't even fit on one line. If you want to read it out, it's 806, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we can't really deal with these big long numbers, so we use a shorthand. It's, if the 8 were a 10, it would then be 1 followed by 68 zeros. And it's convenient to have a notation for that. We use a subscript, and we write that number as 10 to the power of 68. Um, I mean, just to get the message, <coughs> that 1,000 would be written 10 with a little 3. A million would have 10 with a little 6. A billion, ten to the ninth. So 
10 to the 68 is bigger than big. <laughs> now let's think about the universe for a moment. As you all know, it's 4 by 10 to the 17 seconds old. Well, you have to add one. Add one. Add one. <laughs> okay, if I were to start at the beginning of the universe and every second choose a new arrangement of cards, I would come remotely near covering all the possibilities. If a billion people each had a billion packs of cards, rearranged them all every second, we wouldn't be anywhere close. It's breathtakingly large. So that is a world first. <laughs> it's, it's also a world last. Okay, bang. Why did I say bang? Well, we all love comics, and you see pow, zap, bang, usually ending with an exclamation mark. So that's the notation that's used here. Um, 52 with the exclamation mark can be read, 52 bang. I don't know if that's official. <coughs> and you can make even more incredibly large numbers by going bang, bang. So you, you take this enormous number and put a little exclamation mark at the end of it. You have to multiply it by all the smaller numbers. And things get breathtakingly large. 52 bang, bang, I cannot describe. It's indescribable. But if we go back to three, three bang is three by two by one, which is six. So three bang, bang is six bang, which is six by five by four, three to one, 720. Not so big, but now 720 bang is vastly bigger than 52 bang. So that's probably the biggest number we'll see today. Uh, oh, it's given down the end. It's not the biggest, actually. It's only 10 to the power of 1,700 and something or other. So you can construct enormous numbers. I mean, if you really want to annoy people, go bang, 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 bang. <laughs> <laughs> so by, I, in looking at this, I came across, I stumbled upon a curiosity. Four bang is 24. Four bang, bang comes out at 6.2 by 10 to the 23. And of course, as you all immediately recognize, this is very close to Avogadro's number. The chemists will know the number of molecules. Roughly the number of molecules in a cup full of water is about 10 to the 23. That's, it's, but that is just a coincidence. Okay, we really live in a very extraordinary world and it's changing every day. Uh, I just repeated the title slide there. And then I thought, it would be nice to put it into Hindi. Um, now, to say my Hindi is rusty <laughs> would be to mislead you. But I have a phone with Google Translate. I fired up Google Translate, pointed it at that, and pressed the camera icon. And what happens? There we are. Seems that is my name. <laughs> I did manage to make out this bar act. Can you read Ireland? Perfect. Yes. Oh, there you are. It's interesting. This would have been utterly impossible ten years ago. There were major advances in artificial intelligence and deep learning in 2012, and since then it just has rocketed forward. So now you can go to a menu. You go on your holidays to Italy. Click the menu, and here you have your menu in English. Extraordinary. So I'm glad there's no, there's nothing terribly offensive. <laughs> it's miraculous, really. Um, I'll move on now to <clears throat> mathematics in India. This is an enormous story. Not quite as big as Factorial 52, but it's a very big story. Uh, so I'll really only be able to do a whistle stop tour. And uh, I won't read all of those out because I come to each in turn. Uh, the earliest civilization in the Indus Valley was maybe two or two and a half centuries BC, uh, millennia BC. Um, I know very little about this topic, so I have to rely on secondary sources. And this is one of them. This is a book. It's about in its third edition now, so by Joseph, by George Joseph, <coughs> who was actually <coughs> born in Kerala. So he has a great affinity with the, the uh, local situation. And his main focus is on the Kerala school, which I'll describe later. But it gives the perspective. We have a very euro 
Anglo-centric perspective here, and I'm even an Anglo-centric perspective, which often blinds us to what's going on elsewhere. So this is quite a nice source. Um, so that's a map of the, the Indus Valley, and somewhere on the map is Harappa. Uh, see, uh, here we are. It's actually on the river Rabi, so it's near Lahore in modern day India. And there was a civilization flourishing there for quite a while. Now there's evidence, there's not a lot of evidence, but some evidence that there was mathematical thinking going on, because there appears to have been a structured system of weights and measures. And that doesn't just happen accidentally. And um, you know, they used a, a decimal-based numeration system, and there were thousands, if not millions, of bricks found, all having quite sharply defined ratios in their proportion. So the length to the breadth to the height is in the ratio of four to two to one. I mean, you could call that an industrial standard. It doesn't happen by accident. And you can see that it makes life a lot sim simpler. I mean, try putting together a Lego set with different sizes of bricks. It doesn't work too well. So uh, there was definitely mathematical thinking going on, but we haven't, we, uh, the world has not decoded or decrypted a lot of the inscriptions from that time so that we don't know, and they don't even seem to know which language family they were using there. It seems to have been a kind of proto dravidian language from the south, of, now from the south of India. But uh, there's a lot to be found out. Nobody has found anything equivalent to the Rosetta Stone, which was a wonderful uh, thing to find to decode the hieroglyphs. So there's a problem for the future to figure out more about this. Now we move to the Vedic times. Uh, the ambassador mentioned the Vedic age. Uh, the Vedas are among the oldest literary works. Um, they're written in the form of sutras or aphorisms, memorable aphorisms that people could uh, pass on. And they have all sorts of details, religious rituals and um, hymns and prayers and so on. And also, details for designing the altars, which were necessary. There were strict rules about what shape they would be and what orientation. That's a picture from Joseph's book. And you can see here it's in the shape of a falcon. They must have been placating the falcon god. And uh, it's quite intricate and requires precise measurements and structure. So it, it in indicates a very major advance now, at the same time as the Vedas, there was a secondary uh, block of literature called the Sulma Sutras, and they gave more details, more secular material about mathematics. It's clear they knew about the theorem of Pythagoras, as you all remember from school. <laughs> <laughs> a triangle with sides three, four, and five is a right angle triangle. And of course, three squared plus four squared is nine, and 16 is 25, which it's a square root of 25. So that's it, always a right angle triangle. And it's practically very handy when you construct it. Uh, then we come to the Jains. The Jain religion emerged sometime in the middle of the first millennium BC. And um, I mentioned, I have to read it slowly, the Surya Prajnapti Sutra, which gives details of uh, some of their mathematics. In particular, they had the square root of 10 as an estimate of pi. So that's actually within 1%, which is kind of good enough for engineering and surveying and so on. It's reasonably good. Uh, later on, of course, there were much better estimates. I give this one that's in the displayed equation. Pi is 355 over 113. It's very easy to remember. You write 113355, you put the second half on top of the first half. It's simple to remember. You all learned, as I did, 22 over 7. Rush. <laughs> so it's not as good as that. So um, it, it also the Jains, they didn't care about the shapes of altars or rituals or that. They were much more kind of intellectual, thinking about the nature of the cosmos and time. They had a cycle of existence which went on a vast number of years and then all over again with no beginning and no end. And who knows, here we are going on about the Big Bang as if it's a big deal. I mean, what was before the Big Bang? I don't know. So they were actually a lot more imaginative, I think, than we tend to be today. 
sometimes where they blinkered. And that's a modern, well, modern 1500 AD. It's a modern uh, reproduction of, of this uh, Jain scripture, um, which dates from about 400 BC. And I just put it there just to point out something, a small detail. If you look here, you see the swastika, which of course was a sacred symbol um, in the East, in India, and China, and Japan, long before it became utterly toxic. And we can't use it now without the connotations. So it may take another 500 years before it's, it's kind of possible to use that. Um, now, astronomy then was of great interest because of the dependence on the weather and on the seasons and rain. So that involved measuring angles and calculating signs and so on, the development of trigonometry, and a lot of that work was in India. What we learned in school, the sign of an angle. If you don't remember the definition, don't worry about it. Uh, but we learned about it, and the modern ratio that we use actually first emerged in India. And uh, the major figure at that time, around 500 AD, was Aryabhata. And he wrote something called the Aryabhatiya. And there's a list of some things you can find in this. So 500 AD, they were considering ratios, uh, tables of signs, ratios, uh, techniques for square roots and cubed roots, how to evaluate pi, um, areas and volumes and so on. So quite a large body. And if you just think what was going on in, in Europe in 500 AD, it's a great contrast to this. So we come to the numbers and zero. Where would we be without the numbers? So um, the decimal place system, it really, we owe it to India, uh, in particular this the numeral zero. I should um, differentiate between number and numeral. A number is an abstract concept. Uh, a numeral is something you can see or hear or write down, whatever. So, so the numeral, the symbol seven here, no brilliant point in there. Um, it's a seven is the symbol we know, but it means seven million here, it means seven thousand here, it means seven here. And that seems a simple thing, but that's an extraordinarily powerful notation that enables us to represent all the numbers with just ten symbols. And the little white block there shows the uh, Devanagari numerals, maybe from 500 AD or so. And they're essentially what we use today. If you look at the one, two, three, it's very similar, really. It's quite clear we owe it. The origin of our modern numbers is here in India. And of course, the last one on the list, the little circle, is the zero. Um, Pierre Simon Laplace, the great French physicist and mathematician, said this, it's in India, it is India that gave us the ingenious method of expressing all numbers by means of 10 symbols. And he then he remarks that this escaped, eluded the attention of Archimedes and Apollonius and all the great Greek thinkers. So it was really quite an achievement. A zero, we don't know when it emerged exactly, but sometime in the first millennium, uh, Brahma Gupta, uh, oh, I won't remember his dates, because that's 700, I think. Um, in his writing, the Brahma Sutta Siddhanta, there's actually rules for manipulating zero and negative numbers. Negative numbers were not accepted in Europe till about 1500, so quite a long time later. And that's um, the first solid evidence for zero occurring in the written form. I think there are some claims of earlier ones. Gwalior is a town not too far from Agra. And that's a temple in Gwalior. And on the right hand side you see a carved panel. And somewhere in the middle, if we can maybe just make out 270. And it's just like we would write it today. That's the first really solid example of the number zero. Did I say the number zero? Really should have said the numeral zero. <laughs> yeah. uh, but that's so from then on, of course, there's lots more evidence. So we're indebted for that. Okay, 
I'll go fast through the next part, but there's a list of very renowned mathematicians from 500 <coughs> for the next five or 600 years. And actually each one of these would deserve a full lecture, but I'm not the person to give it. I don't know enough about this. I'll just say a little bit about Brahmagupta, who I've mentioned already, and the last one on the list, Bhaskaracharya, or Bhaskar II. Um, we've heard about Brahmagupta. Here's a nice formula for people who like formulas. I don't know why. Ah, something has gone fishy. Okay, that's just supposed to be the square root sign. Not quite know, but the gremlin. Okay, we have a quadrilateral, a four-sided figure with sides A, B, C, D. You can define the quantity S by just adding them all up and dividing by two. So it's halfway around. The semi-perimeter is S. And then this formula will give you the area of the quadrilateral. So we have a field of an irregular size. This is a way to find it out. There's actually a condition here that Brahmagupta didn't specify. He certainly knew about it, but he didn't actually say it. If you think of a square, all the sides are the same. But you can flatten the square down to a rhombus and then to a line. So the area is diminished. So actually, the four sides are not enough. Is Brahma Gupta slipping up there? In a sense, it's a pity he didn't write down it must be a cyclic quadrilateral. Uh, but of course, he, he definitely knew that. So, and there are other things he did. And then I mentioned the, the other man, Bhaskar Acharya, quite a bit later than that. And his best known treatise is known as the Nilavati. There's various stories about that, but I have time. Uh, he described linear and quadratic equations, measuring areas, arithmetic, arithmetic and geometric progressions. You learned all this at school, maybe you've forgotten, but irrational numbers and Pythagorean triads. It's fairly elementary to us now, but that was all cutting-edge mathematics at the time. So we come now to the Kerala school, and as far as I know, this was kind of quite new, a new discovery that there was this tribal <coughs> school. I don't think it was well appreciated uh, long ago. The table, again, is not for you to worry about details. It's just to indicate there was a continuity here in the school for some hundreds of years. Um, and many wise savants made contributions. The first name is Madhava, and he was the real the founder, in a sense, of the school. And he did quite a few amazing things. Um, he actually developed series expansions for the sines and the cosines and this inverse tangent. Don't worry about the details of the, um, of the equation here, but in a special case, you get this series. Now, this is amazing. What do you do? You take the odd numbers, one, three, five, seven, nine. Take them upside down, one, one third, one fifth, one seventh, and ninth. And then alternately add and subtract, add and subtract forever. And it comes to pi over four. This is astounding, really. You would wonder, what's pi got to do with this? I don't see any circles around. But Madhava actually discovered that. Today we call it the Gregory Leibniz formula because we didn't know that it had been discovered for hundreds of years earlier by Madhava. Uh, he didn't write it down in the nice notation. I mean, this way of writing is very nice and very compact and powerful. The notation can be very powerful. Uh, he had to write things like to define pi add 4 to 100, multiply by 8, and add 6 to 2,000. It doesn't exactly trip off the tongue. You have to decode this and parse it to see what's going on. And that's the way he described the series. But nevertheless, when you do that, it's clear that he had the series. And he had more powerful series with accelerated convergence, which enabled him to evaluate pi to 11 decimal places. Quite astounding. That table, you don't need to read every word on that, but the left column gives some mathematical um, topics, and then the middle column gives the Indian mathematician who studied them first, and then on the right-hand column, uh, when they emerged in, in Europe. So you see the very first one was zero. This came probably well before Brahmagupta, 
And we didn't have zero for rather a long time. It wasn't accepted really in Europe until maybe 1400 or something. And the second last one is the infinite series for pi. This was the data. As I say, it took another few hundred years for Leibniz and Gregory, as a German and a Scottish mathematician, independently to discover that formula. That brings us to the, the kind of whole question of how did this knowledge, was it rediscovered or was it transmitted? And that I can't, I have no expertise to comment on that. It's just, it's a controversial issue and there are many unanswered questions about how the information might have got from Kerala to Europe. But of course, there were many uh, Jesuit uh, missionaries in Goa and that part of India. So, and they had an interest in learning. So it's quite possible it was actually taken back. It's an open question. We don't know. OK, well, the penultimate section now. Um, sorry about that. Something happened here. I feel enthusiastic. Anyone know what Googleology is? Oh, come on. <laughs> Good golly, this mommy. I know what Googleology is. It's the study of enormous numbers. Okay, in 1938, a little boy was asked, well, what's the biggest number? You know, and he came up with a number he called the Google. And it was popularized then in this book by Castor and Newman, um, a book which I read many years ago that told the story of this. So the boy said, you just get write one and then write a hundred zeros. And then he said, what do you call it? A Google. So that's what he called it. And of course, we don't have to write the hundred zeros. We have our nice compact notation, 10 to the power of 100. It's pretty big. Is it as big as 52 factorial? Bigger. 52 factorial was about 10 to the 68 or something. This is 10 to the 100. Can we go any further? Well, yes. Um, by the way, the founders of Google were looking for a name for their company, and they found out about the Google, but somebody misspelt or mistyped the name. And they found, oh, Google isn't, uh, hasn't been patented. Let's go for that. So we're actually living with a big mistake. <laughs> My opinion would be a, a company with such a stupid name hasn't a hope of succeeding. <laughs> Don't buy shares. It seems how, how much use my advice on financial matters is nothing. And then they, they went a bit further and said, what if you have one with a Google of zeros after it? And they call that a Google Plex, a Google Plex. And it's kind of indescribable. I mean, it's written down in symbolic form there. You can write it down, but it's difficult to conceive. Um, the headquarters of Google in California is actually called the Googleplex. Googleplex or Googleplex. I think they stick with the mistake. Googleplex. So that's Googleology for you, and it goes on. But what excuse have I for talking about it here? Well, there was a tradition in India. There was even a passion with large numbers going back thousands of years. And it's found in a lot of different traditions, in the Vedic and the Jaina and the Buddhist literature. Um, so they, uh, for example, the Yajur Veda names powers up to 10 to the 12. Well, that's not great. But the great uh, Indian epic, the Ramayana, has a list of numbers which is more extensive. There's powers of 10 in a systematic way up to 10 to the 22. But we go further in a moment. I just, this, the reason for showing this is purely an excuse to show that 10 to the power of 5 is a lakh and 10 to the 7 is a crore. And any of you who are crossword fiends know that already because lakh comes up quite a lot as a clue, as an answer in crosswords. Frank, you knew that, didn't you? <laughs> um, and the table goes on. Still in the Ramayana, they actually went up to 10 to the 62. We're getting close to 52 by here, but they didn't stop there. Now, here's a legend from, the, I have to read slowly, Lalita Vistara, and that's a Mahayana Buddhist literature. 
And uh, it tells the story of Lord Buddha, uh, his activities before he gave his first sermon, before in a sense he entered public life, as it were. He started his first sermon and went teaching. And he was renowned, this is legend of course, but he was renowned for his numerical prowess. And he was asked to name the, number, the magnitudes and Siddhartha Gautama listed powers up to 10 to the 421, really, uh, in a systematic way. And they're itemized how they're put together in that, uh, in that work. But they didn't stop there. Another Buddhist um, sutra, and uh, forgive me, I must read slowly, Avatam Saka Sutra, uh, gives numbers really just beyond the beyonds. The largest named one is known as the untold. And there's a long, uh, a long title in Sanskrit, which I won't read, but it comes to 10, to the power of 10, to the power of 37. It's rather vast. So, I mean, there was a, it was a passion, really. It was intriguing to explore just how far can you go. So I made a little table, forgetting 52 mile, um, but we start with a million, which is tiny. Avogadro is no more well known. The, the number of particles in the universe is 10 to the 85, so I'm told I didn't count them. Then we have Google, the centillion. The untold is there in the middle, the Google flex. And then there are numbers even more vast. Now, if you ask yourself, for every particle in the universe, it's in a certain place and moving in a certain direction. When will that happen again? For the entire universe is going to a cycle. And Poincaré made an estimate and came up with this normal number, which is a stack of powers, one above the other. It's just vast. I keep running out of adjectives. Vast beyond. <laughs> OK, I'm coming now to probably, hopefully, the most interesting topic in the talk, <coughs> the story of Srinivasa Ramanujan. He was quite a remarkable man. He had a tragically short life. He lived only 32 years. Uh, he was a self-taught genius, uh, living in the south of India. Uh, he grew up in the town of Kumbakonam, which is in modern-day Tamil Nadu. It would have been in the Madras presidency in his day. Now it's near uh, Chennai, modern-day Chennai. Uh, his family was very poor. They were Brahmin, though, and had a great respect for knowledge and learning. And I think it's, when I think about it, I mean, his family, his mother in particular, supported him, even though his activity in mathematics wasn't contributing in any material way to the family. And they were immensely poor. So it was quite um, a commitment to do that. I suppose every mommy thinks her son is a genius. <laughs> <laughs> his mommy was correct. So um, now that's a map showing uh, India. Um, Kumbakona is just there. There's Chennai on the grass in this area. I just mentioned that's Kerala on the other side of the peninsula. And that on the right is the house where Srinivasa grew up. And an earlier picture shows the house on the right. But down the street is this wonderful temple Vishnu, the Sarangapani temple. I've never been there, but it must be incredibly wonderful. Uh, he would have spent quite a lot of his time there. It was pretty hot in the summer and pretty wet in the rainy season. And going in there gave you some sort of a chance of doing mathematics undisturbed. Uh, he, uh, the town itself was known for its metalwork. And uh, it's also renowned for production of high quality silk saris. I mentioned that, Ambassador, because of your wife's interest in the saris. <laughs> so, um, now Ramanujan was a very spiritual man. I mean, he was very intensely religious and he devoted to the family goddess who is Namagiri of Namakal. And Namakal is a town about 100 miles west of Kumbakonam. And he believed that Namagiri inspired him and filled his dreams with mathematical insights. And one might tend to raise an eyebrow, us sophisticated people, you know. But if I were to ask you, 
where does inspiration come from? Where does creativity come from? We have no better answer than to say it comes from Nahamagiri, or our equivalent. So I mean, that was his rationalization, I guess. An equation for me has no meaning unless it expresses a thought of God. It's sort of profound. Um, numbers, and they used to say were his personal friends. Um, Hardy was, I think it's fair to call him uptight. I'll talk about Hardy in a moment, but he was very British, and he was very reserved. And, that. and uh, the first thing he said, he visited Ramanujan in hospital. He said, I mean, imagine opening it, instead of saying, how are you? He says, I came in a taxi today, numbered 1729. <laughs> it seems to be a rather dull number. <laughs> and Ramanujan said, oh no. It's not dull, it's a very interesting number. It's the smallest number that can be expressed in two different ways as the sum of two cubes. It's astounding. I mean, I believe that if Hardy had said, I came in taxi 4397, Hardy, uh, Chan would have had another <laughs> remarkable fact to relate. It's, it's really quite extraordinary, his, his familiarity with numbers. Nobody else to equal it. Now, his academic record, I'm glad to say, was atrocious. He failed all his exams and was kicked out of college. But of course, a few people recognized his brilliance. And most people were not simply able, even the mathematicians there couldn't really quantify just the level of his achievements. But they realized the only way forward is to get him to go to England. <clears throat> I mean, there were clear ties between England and India, of course. And uh, he wrote to three different professors in Cambridge. And we'll, we'll pass quietly over two of them. And the third one replied. And that was Godfrey Har Hardy. And here's the letter he wrote. It's much too small for you to read. But I'll just highlight. So I beg to introduce myself as a clerk in the accounts department of the Port Trust office at Madras on a salary of only 20 pounds per annum. And that was something arranged for him by his friends. And then later on, I would request you to go through the enclosed papers. And he attaches 10 or 20 sheets of mathematics. Uh, so there's the first one. You'll immediately recognize all the bangs. Look at that. Um, there are factorials all over the place, infinite series, a huge integral with gamma, functions and so on. These uh, things on the right are known as continued fractions. Quite amazing. Um, some of you might notice this little combination here is the golden number. It's a special number. Hyperbolic functions. Good Lord. Oh, now, Hardy got this, and his immediate first reaction was, this is a hoax. You know, somebody's playing a trick on me. Uh, but as he sort of looked at them, he realized he knew some of the formulas already. But other ones, he was completely mystified. He said, nobody could have made them up. You know, they looked valid, and nobody could have made them up. So he actually arranged for Ramanujan to come to Cambridge. It took a year or two for reasons I have to skip. But the two of them then worked very fruitfully for five years and published some of the most extraordinary papers in mathematics that we have ever seen. It's not quite a word first, like my one, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but it really was amazing stuff. And uh, with the help of Hardy, he was, he, he was elected the Fellow of the Royal Society, which is really the acme, acme of academic recognition, and also a fellow of Trinity College <coughs> Cambridge. So, what about his legacy? Well, he's still very influential. People are still looking through his work, and it hasn't all been really studied deeply. So there's still more to be done. And it has influenced, in fact, I have a colleague in UCD who works more or less exclusively on ideas coming from Ramanujan, on things called mock Peta functions. And uh, the modern theory of modular forms is springing directly from Ramanujan's work. 
So he's still, his work is still bearing fruit today. It's amazing, 100 years after his death. And India, of course, honors him in many ways, but in particular by issuing postage stamps. I mean, he's really recognized now as a big deal. At four different occasions, I think they issued stamps. And there are statues here, there, and everywhere. That's just one I got off the web in Kolkata. So um, that's really him. Now, I thought I'd have to put in a bit of Latin to have some academic gravitas. <laughs> oh, bad he was. Where are we going? That's all it is. Where are we going? Well, the knowledge of Indian maps, there are many gaps, and we're learning all the time. Our view has changed quite a lot in the last 20 or 30 years with a greater understanding. There is huge uncertainty still. One that I mentioned specifically was how important or how effective was the transmission of knowledge from India to Europe. There are many uncertainties there. So the future will tell us. And I just end with a thank you again.
Thank you so much, Professor Lynch, for taking out time for this, for conducting this fascinating lecture on an intriguing subject. I'm sure it must have instigated interest in many to learn more about it. I also thank everyone here for joining us today in the embassy and to the audience who have joined us through, uh, uh, through our Facebook streaming. Thank you so much.